Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, emptied himself and took upon him the form of a servant. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. In his poem entitled, He Attempts to Love His Neighbor, maritime poet Alden Nolan describes the alienation experienced by one who abides in love. My neighbors, he says, do not wish to be loved. They have made it clear that they prefer to go peacefully about their business and want me to do the same. This ought not to surprise me as it does. I ought to know by now that most people have a hundred things they would rather do than have me love them. There is television, for instance. The truth is that almost everybody, given the choice between being loved and watching TV, would rather choose the latter. Love interrupts dinner, interferes with mowing the lawn, washing the car, or walking the dog. Love is a telephone ringing, or a doorbell waking you moments after you finally succeeded in getting to sleep. So we must be careful, those of us who were born with the wrong number of fingers or the gift of loving. We must do our best to behave like normal members of society and not make nuisances of ourselves, otherwise it could go hard with us. It is better to bite back your tears, swallow your laughter, and learn to fake the mildly self-deprecating titter favored by the bourgeoisie than to be left entirely alone, as you will be, if your disconformity embarrasses your neighbors. I wish I didn't keep forgetting that. Love that is intended to bind human hearts together as one, the poet seems to be saying, is not experienced as such by the lover or the beloved. For the beloved, Love interrupts, interferes. It threatens to awake us from the precious gift of sleep finally achieved. Finally here having both the sense of it long last and complete in itself. For the lover, on the other hand, love rejected has the effect of dislocating him from his fellows. Love offered is received with embarrassment by the beloved that embarrassment leads to avoidance. The precious gift of love, gift here both in the sense of the, born, the inborn talent for loving and the gift of love bestowed upon the beloved. The gift of love is rejected as freakish and unnerving. In the end, the lover tells us it is better to allow love to die, to bite back tears, swallow laughter, and learn to fake the mildly self-deprecating titter favored by the bourgeoisie, than to be left entirely alone, cast out of society on account of the disconformity of our lover. Yet for all that, the lover, the poet, cannot heed his own advice, cannot but love. It is too deeply etched into his being. I wish, he said, I didn't keep forgetting that. This morning our liturgy speaks of such disconformity and the alienation and disunity it occasions. First, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Zion rejoices to see her king coming unto her in fulfillment of ancient prophecy to liberate her from oppression and to restore her to unity with herself. Then that same king's betrayal, humiliation, torture, death. Sometime they strew his way and his sweet praises, saying, resounding all the day, hosannas to their king. Then crucify is all their breath, and for his death they thirst and cry. You know, the world looks upon the glory at the heart of the Christian religion, and the world sees only the glorification of cruelty. What loving father, it cries, can stand idly by while his son is mocked and spitted on 
nailed to a tree and left to die in agony as his mother looks on, let alone give his consent to that death and require the consent both of the son and the mother. And from the world's point of view, this is entirely reasonable and entirely just. Much better from the world's point of view to make stones into bread and to save people that way. But faith sees more. Because faith looks beyond the tangle of human cruelty and suffering and sees in the beloved the self-forgetfulness of love that reveals to the lover his own essential beauty. When faith has become alive to that love, it gains the courage to gaze upon the beloved without flinching and to become conformed to that love. Love crucified, love perfected in its intention to love at all costs, knows herself to exist in the very heart of love itself, knows herself so fully loved that she cannot doubt of her essential beauty. That fearlessness sees beyond the cruelty of its beloved's rejection and will keep forgetting its solitude. Indeed, she is never truly in solitude, except from the world's commotion, for she dwells in the heart of love itself. And she therefore continues to love, in spite of crucifixion, continues to submit to crucifixion at the hands of the angry for the sake of the love that has loved her and taught her her own essential beauty, the assurance of which is the center of her courage to love. My song is love unknown, my Savior's love to me, love to the loveless shown, that they might lovely be. But who am I that for my sake my Lord should take frail flesh and die? Yet there is more. For faith crucified, faith perfected in crucified love, tends to vision. And vision reveals not only our own essential beauty, the essential beauty of the whole cosmos, ordered as a whole to the good itself. Vision beholds all things, even the world's cruelty and sin, and knows all of it to be ordered and governed by wisdom that is love, which reaching from one end of human history to another, mightily and sweetly doth order all things. All things even our very sins, to itself. Yet how can these things be? Why does love insist on ruling the world in a manner that allows for crucifixion? It's because love, essential love, will never be satisfied until the intellects of all its wayward creatures come to see first that there is nothing in them, even their waywardness and their sin, that has not arisen from a longing for essential love. And second, that essential love has ordered even these things, even our wandering and our sinfulness, so as to become the means of our attaining that same essential love. Essential love sees beyond the fear that rejects, beyond the unloveliness that the beloved perceives in herself, to the entire and essential desire of her heart, unmixed with the anguish of loneliness that has led her into alienation, to the death of love. Essential love sees beyond all this, penetrating to the very center of our being, and for the sake of a love that in us is no more than potential, for as yet it is nothing in us, but simply his presence in us, bears the weight of our anger and submits by it to be crucified. It is love, essential, triune love, that not only moves the sun and the other stars, but which takes the form of a slave to reveal itself to us as friendship. It is first a friendship of God extended to man, 
Yet that friendship between God and man becomes the form of reciprocity that binds all men into unity one with another, transforming and transfiguring the cruel and divided city of history into the heavenly Jerusalem, which is nothing more or less than our human nature as it is renewed and restored in him. All of this, all of this, is what we contemplate in Holy Week. And that contemplation is the whole work of this Holy Week. Let us go about it in faith and in love. And may that love crucified lead to the increase of our faith. And may that faith succeed at length to vision. That with the poet we may sing both in time and in eternity. Here might I stay and sing, no story so divine. Never was love, dear king, never was grief like love. This is my friend, in whose sweet praise I all my days could gladly spend. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.